Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the 19th of January, 2015. The podcast that's in your drives, decrypting your chats. This is your host, Shane Killian, and joining me again this week is Jonathan Loche. John, welcome back to the show. Hopefully I don't have shitty audio this week. Welcome back. <laughs> Let's DDoS the news of the bogus. And the big news this week is an update on stories we've covered before about the Darknet, specifically the website Silk Road, the online marketplace run by one Dread Pirate Roberts. This week, the trial of Ross Ulbricht, the man accused of being Roberts, started, and pretty much off the bat we're seeing the makings of a kangaroo court. Yeah, this is... it is very hard to prove that Ulbricht was the quote-unquote Dread Pirate Roberts, and the fact that... The government knows that they're going after the usual sort of, it had to be him because reasons. <laughs> well, they've actually got the start of a pretty good case. Of course, the defense really hasn't had a crack yet, but we'll talk about it. Albrecht has admitted that he did invent Silk Road. Mm -hmm. And he invented it and he ran it for a couple months and then he turned it over to other people. And his attorney is Joshua Drattel, I think is how it's pronounced, who uh, said, quote, Ross is not a drug dealer. Ross is not a kingpin. Ross is not involved in a conspiracy. And so the idea is that any drugs or any other illegal activities on the site had nothing to do with him. He, he just set up the website so that people could do whatever. And then after that, he didn't have anything to do with it. Yeah. Now, Shane, you, you and me are both good Southern boys. Yeah. I assume you've been to a flea market before. Oh, yeah. You, you've seen, I'm sure if you've been to a flea market long enough, you've seen some sort of pseudo-illegal -ill activity go on there. Not things like drugs or whatever, but things that are kind of questionable. Maybe more gray market than black market. Yeah. Like pirated movies and things like that. Yeah. That, that, that's what I was sort of thinking of, like pirated movies and CDs. Yes, yeah, so you can get the Star Wars Christmas special there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Although why you would want to, I don't know. But still, like... You wouldn't see the cops going after the flea market owners if right. some dude was selling pirated movies at a flea market booth. Well, I mean, even Craigslist. You know, there's people trying to sell drugs on Craigslist. There's lots of prostitution going on on Craigslist. And the police find it and they go after the people involved. They don't go after Craigslist. In the 90s, they passed the Communications Decency Act which was a horrible piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. But one thing it did that was not so bad was it said that you cannot hold the owners and operators of a website responsible for actions of their users. Right. I mean, as long as they're not encouraging it, as long as they're not saying, hey, come to Silk Road and deal drugs or something like that. Right. If they're just doing it, it's not up to the site owners to police everything. Now, of course, the DMCA pretty much destroyed that when it came to copyright. But there's nothing like that with anything else. So. so, dragging someone from Mexico to force her into prostitution, that's perfectly okay. Pirate a movie, you're going to jail. But we first saw the hippity-hop-hop of the kangaroo when there were people outside handing out flyers. And I don't know if these are the Fiji flyers or what, but they had something to do with jury nullification. Oh, dear. And Judge Forrest told the jurors not to look at the flyers until... They were dismissed or the trial concluded. I've actually heard that happen in more than one trial before. Oh, it's a fairly standard thing. They do not want you to know about your right of nullification if you're a juror. Mm -hmm. But there's something else, because he was also accused of hiring a hitman to take out the competition and things like that, and that's the part that a lot of people find a little more difficult to believe, especially since... He allegedly hired them with dollars instead of Bitcoin, and he would have to have known that that could be traced, but whatever. The point is, that's not this trial. There's going to be a separate trial in a different state where they examine that. And yet, the judge said that the prosecutor can tell the jurors about him hiring hitmen without having to show evidence or anything like that, because there's nothing prejudicial about it. And boing goes the kangaroo. Yeah, I mean, isn't that the whole point of our justice system is innocent till proven guilty, or in this case... Well, I mean, even if they had had the trial earlier, mm -hmm. and he had been found guilty about it, 
it's still under our normal laws of jurisprudence, it still would not be admissible unless Ulbricht himself takes the stand, in which case it can be used to attack his credibility. Yeah. But as long as there are two different trials, they're not supposed to do that. Well, th th that to me is the bigger thing, is the fact that there are two separate trials that, at this point, have he hasn't even been found guilty of hiring a hitman. It just drops the curtain right off and reveals who's really behind the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Yeah, here's the quote from Judge Catherine Forrest, quote, Evidence that defendants sought to protect this sprawling enterprise by soliciting murders for hire is not unduly prejudicial. Also, she won't let him know what witnesses are going to be testifying against him until a week before the trial began. Well, isn't that lovely? Because he might put out hitmen against them. Well, it's nice to know this judge has already made up her mind that he's guilty. Yeah, pretty much. So anyway, Drattel admitted in court that Ulbricht did found Silk Road, but according to uh, Andy Greenberg, a reporter that was in the courtroom, quote, Drattel went on to explain that the site was meant merely to be a kind of economic experiment that Ulbricht only controlled for a brief time. The eventual adoptive owners of the Silk Road would later trick Ulbricht into serving as the fall guy when they sensed an impending law enforcement crackdown. After a few months, this is Drattel, quote, After a few months, he found it too stressful for him, and he handed it over to others. At the end, he was lured back by these operators to take the fall for the people running the website. Ross was not a drug dealer. He was not a kingpin. Well, I'll make sure not to uh, walk by any buses next to him. <laughs> well, but I mean, that's something that people do all the time. I mean, we see this in the real world. With drug dealers, they say, oh, you know, point to the kingpin and we'll, you know, reduce your sentence and all this and we'll give you a special deal. Do they point to the guys up the list? No, they don't. They point to the guys down who don't have anyone else to point to. And then they say, OK, here's this guy. He's this big drug kingpin and he ends up being this nobody street dealer or something. Oh, yeah. But there are questions about how they got this information because... According to Greenberg, the prosecution basically admitted that they hacked into Silk Road's site without a warrant, which would probably poison most, if not all, of the evidence that they got from that. And also there's a question about whether the NSA participated in this. Uh, and what happens is they can get, and I mean, this isn't just with online stuff, they can get evidence from an unlawful search or whatever and then make what's called a parallel construction, where they, like, work backwards, like, what's another way we could have gotten this evidence, and then claim that that was how they got it. I, 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 I'm not having a stroke. <laughs> okay. I was worried a second. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> I'm, just so, I'm just so utterly shocked by this. But Bruce Schneier has talked before about this. He's a security expert. And he's talked before about how we know, because of the Snowden documents, the NSA, I think we've talked about this, the NSA gives information to the FBI and the DEA under the condition that they lie about it in court. Again, just for the sake of my health. <laughs> oh, yeah, the whole backdoor thing, that is, I mean, do you and me, that would be blatantly unconstitutional. Even if it were unconstitutional, just, I find it unconscionable. We are spending so much valuable resources and so much time on something that is really... On something that doesn't hurt anyone. Yeah, on being the moral police and that we have no real grounds to prosecute these people in the first place. And that our sheer... By the fact that think we can prosecute these people in the first place and through the war on drugs created this entire entity in the first place. Well, and I think it's just the fact that everything is encrypted and anonymous and there's this mindset running through law enforcement nowadays that if you're encrypting, that must mean that you're up to no good. But they went on to talk about how they got him uh, and they had surveillance on him uh, as he left his apartment. And apparently they had this inside guy in Silk Road who was who who managed to get himself up as one of the administrators. And I think his job was to police the comments for spam and things like that. So they got him in. They followed him to uh, an open Wi-Fi hotspot at a library and then tried to get into a chat with him. And so the idea was to get him to log in as this dread user 
who apparently, allegedly, is Dread Pirate Roberts, and if they could do that and get him talking as Dread, and then go ahead and grab his laptop so it's unlocked, unencrypted, and everything, then they could do it. So this guy, I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name, but he told the court that he took over and controlled the accounts of a lot of buyers and sellers on the site. Probably by, you know, we know you're up to something illegal, but we won't go after you if you cooperate with us, that sort of thing. And so he got uh, control of all these users. And so uh, so he started up this chat on a special chat server that the staff of the uh, Silk Road uses. And so the chat, uh, this guy's login name is Cirrus. Elbricht apparently was chatting his dread. Uh, so Cirrus says, hey, can you check out one of the flag messages for me? Dread. You did Bitcoin exchange before you worked for me, right? Cirrus, yes, but just for a little bit. Dread, not any more then? Cirrus, no, I stopped because of reporting requirements. Dread, damn regulators, eh? Okay, which post? Cirrus, lol, yep, there was the one with the Atlantis. And I really have to call Wired on this because this link that we're doing says, uh, Quote, the Dread Pirate Roberts' last words refer to a competing dark web drug market known as Atlantis that had mysteriously shut down just a few days earlier. But unless they made a typo when they put the transcript up, that wasn't Dread saying that, that was Cirrus. There's absolutely nothing going on in this conversation, at least what was shown in court, other than just uh, looking at posts that have been flagged as spam or whatever. There's nothing really that says that he's been running the site or he's been doing drug deals or whatever, and nothing to say that he's Dread Pirate Roberts other than the username is Dread. But I mean, who knows what that means? Maybe 50 people can use the Dread account. Or there's one called Dread, one called Pirates, one called Roberts. Who knows? Once again, this is the first time I remember. A good chunk of the federal government is still run on goddamn floppy disks. <laughs> what the hell do they know about technology? Well, they did know enough that as soon as that happened, and that, that part that I just read out where it stopped was the point where he flagged everyone to come in, and the, the idea was they run in and immediately grab his laptop and not even close the lid and then arrest him. And that way they could make sure that it's unlocked, unencrypted, and they can get the stuff off of it. So uh, apparently, you know, according to his story, they knew what they were doing. But the defense hasn't really taken their cracks at it yet. and. It might seem like, if you're looking through this, that what the defense is doing is kind of half-assed. But you have to understand that wheel trials don't work the way they do on TV, where, you know, it's all, for dramatic purposes, they have the defense attorney just come up and completely eviscerate the guy. That's not what they want to do in the real trial, because they don't want to give the prosecutor another crack or to try to introduce evidence before. They want the prosecutor to rest first, and they just want to lay the groundwork for everything before then. And it's the closing arguments where they where they really do all that. So we don't really know yet what the defense's response is to this, other than Drattel told the jurors that they believe that the guy who controlled Silk Road is Mark Capellus, who was the head of Mount Gox. Oh, God. Which actually would kind of figure. Yeah. Granted, Bitcoin doesn't deserve another hit job. Yeah. But... It's not really a Bitcoin thing. It's a Mount Gox. I mean, that... People were saying months before Mal Gox went down, get your Bitcoins out of there. Don't do business with them. Mm -hmm. Or if you do, go in there, do what you got to do. And then once you're done, take everything out. Yeah. And Drattel said that Dread Pirate Roberts might be many people and they didn't really have evidence that Ulbricht was even a Dread Pirate Roberts. And under cross-examination of this special agent, the agent said that he had signed a sworn affidavit in August of 2013, stated that he had suspected Carpellis as the controller of Silk Road. And that was two months before they arrested Ulbricht. Hmm. So who knows? Yeah, so basically, once again, they're just looking for a fall guy in all of this. Well, but I mean, it's just weird stuff that doesn't make any sense. Like, incident to the arrest, they searched his apartment, and they found a crumpled piece of paper in his trash can that had details of the buyer and vendor rating system and things like that. Now, first of all, there's nothing illegal about that. Second, the fact that it matches Silk Road. I mean, he's already admitted to creating Silk Road. And third, I mean, if this guy's encrypting everything and he's just going to write something down and, and throw it in the trash, I know. It's just one more of those things. It's like using dollars to pay for the hitman. It just doesn't quite fit with everything. 
That's kind of like when you, if you ever get arrested by a cop and all of a sudden, oh wait, there's a couple of uh, prescription pills that show up by your feet when they show up to the county courthouse. Oh, there's an extra charge. Yeah, that happens. And I mean, neither of us, we don't know if Ulbricht is Dread Pirate Roberts or not. And we don't really have a horse in that race or anything like that, whether it's Ulbricht or the Mt. Gox guy or whoever. But the thing is, you have to follow the process of doing it properly and get the evidence as opposed to just get whoever you can. And unfortunately, police and prosecution in this country are just focused on getting who they can and put one in the win column. Right. Instead of actually proving it. Yeah, it's about, and this one we'll talk about later, it's just about quote-unquote doing something. Yeah. That's all it is. Getting credit for doing it. That's it. Bogosity.tv is a participant in the Amazon Services LLC Associates Program, an affiliate advertising program designed to provide the means for sites to earn advertising fees by advertising and linking to Amazon.com. Just clear your cookies and go to Amazon.Bogosity.tv or check the right-hand side of the podcast page for Amazon's best deals, including the deal of the day and limited-time lightning deals on all sorts of great products. So next time you buy online... Go to Amazon.Bogosity.tv. Okay, so more dietary Bogosity. We've talked before about so-called gluten sensitivity. So if you have celiac disease, you should avoid gluten. But otherwise, it's fine. And it's kind of like if you're lactose intolerant, you should avoid milk. But it's fine for everyone else. In the journal Gastroenterology. And this is a follow-up on a 2011 experiment that was done by Peter Gibson at Monash University. And it was a small study. I mean, he did everything right scientifically, but it was a very small, very preliminary study that said that diets that include gluten can cause gastrointestinal distress even in people who don't have celiac disease. But he knew that it wasn't really sound enough, and he wanted better information on it and maybe figure out what's going on, what's causing the reaction, or is it something else? So he stepped it up for the next level. And this is actually pretty good for a nutrition study. Unfortunately, there's a lot of bad science in nutrition, as we've seen. So it's unusual for them to be this thorough. But what he did was he got 37 subjects. And the idea was that every single meal would be provided for them for the duration of the trial. All of the dietary triggers for gastrointestinal symptoms will be removed, including things like lactose, benzoates. Uh, nitrites and all sorts of things. And then he would also collect nine days worth of urine and fecal matter in addition to getting the uh, individual participants report on it to try and find out everything that was going on. Not one of these 37 subjects had celiac disease, but they all said that they went to a gluten-free diet and their symptoms improved. And that's really the only diagnostic criteria for gluten sensitivity. Is that, you know, you just try it and you feel better. Okay. So they were first fed a control diet for two weeks just to get a baseline, I guess, just to make sure everything's out of their system. And then for a week, they were given one of three diets, a high gluten diet, a low gluten diet, and a placebo diet, which is just a diet with no gluten, but that had whey protein, so they couldn't really tell the difference. And then he switched it up. So every single person at some point got all three of those diets. And of course, they never knew which diet they were on at the time. So, I mean, he's being really thorough here. But each diet caused them to report that their gastrointestinal symptoms were getting worse to degrees that more or less matched each other. And that include pain, bloating, nausea, and gas. And even where they were completely on the placebo diet, where they were on something that was identical to the baseline diet. They still reported their symptoms getting worse. So what he uh, concluded was, quote, In contrast to our first study, we could find absolutely no specific response to gluten. And there's also a third larger study that was published, and that's confirmed the findings. So, so Shane, you're telling me that my, my gluten-free brownies from Whole Foods aren't Making a damn difference. Well, they might make a difference in other ways, but not because of the fact they don't have gluten. And this is actually called the nocebo effect. The placebo effect is when 
You take something and you think you feel better. Placebo means I will heal. Nocebo means I will harm. So a nocebo effect is when you take something and you think you're getting worse, not better. And that's all apparently gluten sensitivity or non-celiac gluten sensitivity is. It's a nocebo effect. There's just nothing to it. I mean, I'm not really surprised by this. The, the whole gluten thing to me was kind of BS to begin, but the fact that... Well, I'm sure the actual celiac sufferers out there are glad that they've got a lot more gluten-free options now. So at least that's a good thing that came out of it. Yeah, I mean, good for them about that. But again, this is the same thing as the whole... And this is even in libertarian circles, the whole folks that, oh, we need to force companies to label things gluten-free or GMO-free. Yeah. When in reality, the market sort of, the market shifted and folks that want to have that option, they have it. In reality, the, the actual medical benefits are uh, a bit shaky. Well, it's just like the organic label. Exactly. Unless you have celiac disease, then it's a good thing. Bogosity.tv and all of its services are hosted at GoDaddy. I've been very satisfied with GoDaddy's services and their wonderful 24-7 customer support for over 10 years now. So I'm happy to be able to give you this special offer. Just sign up for any new domain, web hosting, email, or other service and get 35% off with the code WOWNOBOGON. That's W-O-W-N-O-B-O-G-O-N. Because there's nothing bogus about these savings on quality internet hosting. Just go to GoDaddy.com and use the code WOWNOBOGON. I don't remember if we talked before about that show, To Catch a Predator. That's the one where they would, you know, ride in on the white horse and save kids from being, you know, put on by all these, you know, internet predators, which I'm sure are out there but aren't anywhere near the problem people think they are, but they would show, like, Oh, here's someone, and and we're posing as a 13 year old girl or whatever, and he wants to meet her for sex, and then they arrest him. Yeah. Well, what started happening was people who were involved, especially once I think a lot of this was done over Yahoo, and at some point Yahoo started just archiving all of their chats, and so they were able to get in and get the whole archive, even if they hadn't saved it before. And what they would do is they would come on and initially pretend to be like a 21 year old woman. And to say, hey, I like to pretend to be a 13-year-old girl and have sex. Would you like to do that? And then they say, okay, sure, let's do that. And then from that point on, that's the only transcript they would do. So they they were caught cheating many, many, many times. Maybe the first special that actually aired might have had one or two. But from that point on, it was just nothing more than entrapment. Well, it turns out this horrible bogosity doesn't only happen when the TV cameras are on. All over the country, ordinary people, almost always men, maybe even always men, who are no threat to anyone, are entrapped into situations where they appear to be child predators. And a lot of this comes from an investigative reporter for WTSP in Tampa Bay, down in your neck of the woods. Uh, His name's Noah Pransky. And he exposed the way cops get on and just go fishing for men. They go to adults-only dating sites and once again they have to go to the adult sites we've talked about this before when they try to convince us that child predators are all over facebook and they make a fake 15 year old girl on facebook well they get nothing 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 until she signs up for like a few dozen sex sites and then finally they get a bite so yeah i mean it's all exaggerated it's all for show so again they start off pretending to be legally aged Ladies, you know, 18, 20, 22, whatever. They develop a relationship with the guy, and then either they admit that they're younger, or they just say they like to pretend to be younger or whatever, but they still want to meet. Or like a lot of the time, what he said happens was they say they're eager to meet the guy, but I've got a 13-year-old younger sister that I want to bring along with me. And the men don't indicate any interest in dating her once they think she's younger. They just want to kind of meet his friends or whatever. They're not interested at all in dating the younger sibling, but just the fact they want to meet is doing it just because they're continuing the conversation. That's considered soliciting a minor. And if you meet the older woman who has the younger sibling, then that's the same sort of thing, soliciting minors for sex. And Pransky called this, quote, a pattern of officer misconduct 
in an effort to boost arrest totals. And there was one case where the guy just said time and time again that he did not want to have sex with a 13-year-old sister. And so the older sister, quote-unquote older sister, you know, they, neither one of them really exists, but the older sister would keep saying, oh, but it'd be fun or whatever, you know, you, know, you can come into it. And finally, he agreed to it, probably not even intending to do it, just to go ahead and get that part of the conversation over with and go ahead and meet her, and was promptly arrested when he showed up. It's the same thing as the war on drugs. We're just creating criminals where there really wasn't in the first place. Yeah. So the big question is, why would they do this? And there are really two reasons. And the first one is one we've talked about several times, asset forfeiture. Since soliciting sex from a minor is a felony, they don't have to charge them with anything. I mean, they can know completely that they have no case. But since this is a felony, they can still have their assets seized. Even if no charges are filed, they just, they can take the car, they can take all sorts of stuff, and it's almost impossible to get these things back. Very few people have managed to get their possessions back when it has this cost them thousands and thousands of dollars. So another reason is they get federal money to do this. So they get a lot more money from the feds to track these guys down than they actually spend doing it. And they also... And this reporter also found that the majority of the men that they arrested were either teenagers or in their early 20s who weren't really soliciting minors. They were just looking for women around their own age. So like an 18-year-old wanting to date a 16-year-old or something like that. We've talked about cases like that, too. And it's ruining the lives of innocent people because even if no charges are filed, even if they're completely baseless, as soon as word of this gets out, that guy's life is ruined. Pretty much. And again, not to mention, it's essentially the government going fishing looking to steal from its own populace in the case of asset forfeiture yeah and it's creating hysteria over a problem that for the most part doesn't exist it's a growing problem of us in a case of 24 7 media where we have all these stories of rape murder child molestation what have you it's the desire to quote unquote do something. Yeah. And when you put the government in charge of quote unquote doing something, it's usually a terrible idea. Yeah. But I mean, I'm sure this has been going on a long time. I mean, I even remember back in the 90s, you know, back when it was all text chats and everything, you'd be on a chat board and someone new would come on and claim to be a 13 year old girl and then, you know, start asking questions about sex and things like that. And, some of the more savvy people on there would respond with things like, hello, officer. You know, so they knew this was going on. You know, but it's just, you know, you get people who aren't really that savvy, who aren't really that into it. Uh, and I mean, they're really sneaky about it because, because I mean, they hire like women who are 18, who look like they're 14 or 13, you know, petite women or whatever. So you can even get on cam with someone like that. And they, ah, I'm, I'm really underage well no because you started off this conversation saying you were 18 no turns out she really was 18 she said she was 18 and she just wanted to pretend to be 13 and yeah. but again they don't have to prove anything and they can take your assets you say you don't like bitcoin why not oh because it's not gold no problem just go to coins.pagosity.tv and you'll be taken to Coinable, where you can buy gold or silver coins or bars with your Bitcoins, with literally up-to-the-minute spot pricing. Now there's no reason not to jump on the Bitcoin bandwagon. Whether you're a Bitcoin miner, service operator, Bitcoin business owner, or market speculator, you can get gold and silver from reputable dealers. And Coinable has Bitcoin liquidity for fast processing of your order. Coinable even utilizes a special shipping infrastructure to ensure that your investment arrives safely at your door. And you know what? By going to coins.bogosity.tv, you won't pay a penny more, excuse me, a Satoshi more for your purchase. But you'll help this podcast. You can even sell your gold and silver for Bitcoin as well. Coinable is your Bitcoin to gold marketplace. So go to coins.bogosity.tv and start turning your Bitcoins into gold now. Now, speaking of child sex abuse, it actually did happen. Oh, yeah, it does happen. We're not saying it doesn't. Yeah. 
did we ever talk about the Penn State sex, the child abuse scandal in this podcast before? I don't think so. I'm kind of vaguely aware of it, but I don't really know all the details of what was going on. Basically what happened was Jerry Sandusky was the head, de- was the defensive coordinator for Penn State's football team, one of the top college football teams in the country. He had a charity set up for, you know, at-risk youth and whatnot, and essentially used that as a way to meet children for sex. And the basic long story short of it was the head coach of the time, Joe Paterno, the big scandal was whether or not Paterno knew about it. The closest evidence was when one of the other assistant coaches apparently caught Sandusky actually raping a child in the Penn State locker room Ah. and brought this to Paterno's attention. At best, the story that anybody can agree on is that Paterno then went to the head of the university itself to pass on the information, and the head of the university was just like, uh, well, I told the cops, and they said nothing came of it. There were other less substantiated claims, plenty of other stuff, but long story short, Sandusky, Jerry Sandusky, he is in jail on multiple child sex offenses, will pretty much never see the light of day again until the day he dies. At the end of the day, Paterno was fired for his alleged involvement, and the NCAA, which I have plenty of issues with, while not a quote-unquote government agency or a government agency and everything in spirit, they stripped him of approximately 200 victories. I think all the member universities, though, are publicly funded, aren't they? Or are there there private universities in there as well? There are plenty of... There are... Basically, the NCAA is a collection of universities that compete at the highest level of athletics. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, the University of Notre Dame, the University of Miami, Boston College, Northwestern. So you'd have completely independent colleges like Duke in the NCAA? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if there was a separation like that. There seems to be one in high school. It's like the, the government schools have their own leagues and then the... Charter schools and private schools and everything like that, they compete on a completely separate league or whatever. Yeah, that's not how it is. In in Florida, the private and public schools compete in the same athletic conferences. Okay. But uh, anyway, yeah, with the NCAA, they came in, stripped out Paterno's wins, and essentially they actually came the closest to, uh, there's a, there is actually one thing in the NCAA called the death penalty where they will essentially ban you from competition for up to two years, and Penn State agreed to very severe penalties to avoid that. Well, now it came out that the NCA essentially had no jurisdiction to hand out any penalties. Ah. They had no actual jurisdiction for actual criminal matters. You know, the NCA they, they hand out penalties if, like, a booster gives a, a star QB a false job or something. They regulate the sport itself and the activities going along with it, but they don't actually deal with civil or criminal matters. Right, right. Yeah, so now the NCAA has recently reinstated Paterno's victories, and, you know, people are all up in arms about, oh, this a bastardization of justice because we're talking about multiple child rape victims, and does it really matter whether or not the agency that regulates the sport includes victories as to whether or not he may or may not have found out about it. Well, but in their defense, I kind of have to wonder if maybe they were doing that to kind of preemptively stave off any civil suits, you know, to try and shield themselves from liability. Well, that's the thing. In the leaked emails, they don't even have that. It was essentially, again, it was a charge of, we have to do something, and the university is so ashamed of what happened They'll agree to anything. We have to make the appearance so that we look good to the public. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of it. So, fuck you, NCAA. Fuck you for making a trivial thing of child abuse. And as I said before, really, the justice system's already taken care of this. Uh, Sandusky is never going to see the light of day again. And the other high-level Penn State officials... They're, they're all at some point in the tr- in the uh, justice system. And I'm sure even separately from that, Penn State fired them and things like that. Oh, yeah. Pretty much at this point, everyone who was involved with is either dead, in jail, or even if they cut plea deals, is going to involve some sort of jail time. Yeah. And don't have their jobs anymore. Right. 
why does reinstating victories matter at this point? Well, I guess it would matter for the record. Yeah, I know sports people you know, like looking back on the records and the history of it. Florida State's head coach, my alma mater, Bobby Bowden. At one point, he was number one in total victories because of this, but now he's number two again, so. History is written by the winners, and so apparently is economics. That's why there's LibertyClassroom.com. Probably the best single learning resource for history and economics on the web, LibertyClassroom.com teaches U.S. history, Western Civ, and economics from actual university professors. There's lots of free material to get you started, including introductory lectures on all these subjects, and when you sign up you get the full site's content for just $99 a year, less than the price of two cups of coffee a month. And if you type in the promo code BOGOSITY in all caps, you'll get your first year for just $88. Lectures are available in both video and audio format, so you can watch or listen to them on your computer, your phone or tablet, or in your car. Learn at your own pace about the subjects you're interested in and become a more effective debater. You'll also get access to lots of supplemental materials and even the professors themselves via the discussion forum and even live video chats. Inform yourself against the myths and propaganda of our society. Visit LibertyClassroom.com And now let's cryptanalyze the ciphertext of this week's biggest bogan emitter. And this week it goes to UK Prime Minister David Cameron, who wants to ban any form of encryption that the government can't break. We've heard this before. And we're talking about lots of technologies. The article on The Independent mentions WhatsApp and Snapchat. There are others for your smartphone. There's TechSecure and Redphone, which I think are really good. And I think we've also talked about ways to encrypt email like OpenPGP and GNU Privacy Guard. All of those would be illegal in the UK if Cameron has his way. Well, fuck you. And you know what his reason is for it? Why? You probably knew this was coming. The recent shootings in Paris. You know, I can't even blame the folks that want to claim this is a false flag. Well, even though I know that's probably BS, I can't even blame them. <laughs> well, it's not a false flag, but like always, they seize on any problem as an excuse to pass their pet agenda, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And it really just shows you what horrible people they are. Yeah, they're using fear to get what they want, and blatant sheep that don't know any better. As you say, it's a really sad state of affairs. But, I mean, it's, it's the old song. We've talked about this before. Government wants a way in, but anyway, you can let the good guys in, the bad guys come in too. I mean, whenever you think of something being protected with cryptography or anything like that. Just in your mind, substitute the word math. You're protected with math. Math works the same for everybody. Yeah, it's not like the movies where there's some magical thing that will o only one person, the, the quote-unquote right person, can be able to access. Yeah, so what he said was, quote, In our country, do we want to allow a means of communication between people which we cannot read? Um, yes. Because if you can read it, so can the bad guys. Even if you trust David Cameron, even if for some strange reason you trust all future British prime ministers. If George Bush had said that quote, what, what do you think the majority of people would have said? Yeah. But Cory Doctorow wrote a great blog post on this on Boing Boing, and he makes this same point. If you let the good guys in, you can let the bad guys in. And what he says is, quote, if your WhatsApp or Google Hangouts has a deliberately introduced flaw in it, then foreign spies, criminals, crooked police, and criminals, okay, he put criminals in there twice, will eventually discover this vulnerability. They, and not just the security services, will be able to use it to intercept all of our communications. That includes things like the pictures of your kids in the bath that you send to your parents, or the trade secrets you send to your co-workers. Well, hey, maybe we'll find out the secret recipe to Coca-Cola finally. <laughs> What are KFC's 11 herbs and spices? <laughs> the world wants to know. Hey, hey, you're talking to a Popeye's fanboy. Oh, I love Popeye's. Dr. O also pointed out that David Cameron, unsurprisingly, perhaps doesn't really understand the technology as well and therefore isn't really cognizant of what he's asking. Gee, that's a surprise. And how this would affect all sorts of things, like free and open source projects or things that come from overseas, 
he'll have to have basically Chinese level deep packet filtering to try and stop all of these things from coming into the country. Because, I mean, you can just download GNU Privacy Guard. So, I mean, how how's he going to stop you? Yeah. Uh, what happens when Gmail incorporates end-to-end -end encryption, which we talked about, I think, a few months ago when they announced that? Yeah, that or, I mean, like, uh, you may remember when we had the Gamergate episode and we had uh, one of my podcast co-hosts, Matt, on there. What happens if I do a Skype chat and I'm in the United States and he's in the U.K.? Well, Skype is owned by Microsoft, and I'm sure they've got their NSA backdoors in there. I, I know, but technically it's still two set of laws. Yeah. This is a big thing, and it's unlikely that the U.S. and Canada and other European Union countries and things like that are going to go along with this. So what do you do? You just buy your iPhone in Paris or New York and then just go there and use all your uh, encryption and everything. You can download all of the platforms. Uh, he mentions GNU, Linux, BSD, Mac OS X, all the non-mobile versions of Windows. All of those will let you run whatever software you want. He's talking about the possibility that they might say, okay, Apple and Microsoft, you have to change your operating system to block secure software. But the problem is, A, all you really have to do is change the software just a little bit and you can run it because then it won't recognize it anymore. And B... There's all of the old PCs that we already have that can run the code. Oh, dear. So he bullet points out what David Cameron is actually proposing. Quote, Communications must be easy for criminals, voyeurs, and foreign spies to intercept. Firms within reach of the UK government must be banned from producing secure software. Major code repositories such as GitHub and SourceForge must be blocked. Search engines must not answer queries about web pages that carry secure software. I mean, you think it was hard to block the Pirate Bay before. Pretty much all academic security work in the UK has to stop. All packets in and out of the country and within the country must be subject to Chinese-style deep packet inspections. Walled gardens like iOS and games consoles must be ordered to ban their users from installing secure software. And even then, you can jailbreak the things pretty easily. Anyone visiting the country from abroad must have their smartphones held at the border until they leave. And proprietary operating system vendors, such as Microsoft and Apple, must be ordered to redesign their operating systems as walled gardens, and free and open source operating systems must be banned outright. In order to give David Cameron what he wants, that's what has to happen. Welcome to 1984. Oh, I don't think George Orwell even ever conceived of this. Yeah. But as he points out, Anything less means that it's going to be completely useless because the criminals will always know how to get around it. I mean, whatever phone you have that's jailbroken, whatever operating system you can get that'll let you do it, the bad guys will just use those. And he closes off by saying, quote, stopping people from running code they want to run is, meaning is hard to do, unlike getting around it. And what's more, puts the whole nation individuals and industry in terrible jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And all of that makes David Cameron this week's biggest bogan emitter. Hackers, terrorists, the NSA. But I repeat myself. Your online security is under attack, and the weakest point is your password. That's why you need LastPass. LastPass plugs into your browser and allows you to randomly generate strong, unique passwords anywhere on the web, all protected by one master password. LastPass sets up in minutes and gives you secure automatic logins throughout the web, synchronizing across all your browsers and all your computers, at home, at work, or on the road. It even securely stores sensitive form data, including credit card numbers. Back up sensitive documents, membership info, Wi-Fi logins, and more. And with LastPass Premium, you can get these benefits on other applications and even mobile devices, and also get priority customer support. Sign up at password.bogosity.tv for a free month of LastPass Premium. Log in securely everywhere using the last password you'll ever have to remember. Go to password.bogosity.tv and get LastPass now. And now it's time to deny sick leave to this week's and going back to what we said earlier about what happens when police have incentives 
to do things like turn ordinary innocent men into accused child predators. We see in New York that this is not a problem of a few corrupt cops. It's a systemic problem. The NYPD has threatened to revoke vacation time from police who don't arrest people for victimless nonviolent crimes. We, we all knew this kind of stuff was happening, but my God, really? And I think mostly what they're talking about is things like traffic tickets, but also, I guess, things like, you know, having an ounce on you or something like that, the marijuana. I mean, I mean, yeah, I already knew, like, cops had, you know, unofficial quotas for things like traffic tickets or other BS things, but this is just, wow. So they did all this. They stopped writing tickets and summonses for these victimless crimes, and crime has not increased at all. But the government's revenues have gone down. And so there was a source with the police union that told the New York Post, quote, Police officers around the city are now threatened with transfers, no vacation time, and sick time unless they write summonses. This is the same practice that caused officers to be labeled racist and abusers of power. And I think that was probably part of the motivation. They were tired of all of the racial stuff going on. They're like, well, we're just going to stop doing this stuff because it's racist and it's abusing power. Yeah. <laughs> so basically there were zero citations written for lower level crimes. Citations were down 92%, arrests down 56%. So police commissioner Bill Bratton ordered them to keep doing it. He penalized them by denying vacation time and even in some cases denying them lunch breaks. Which I'm not sure how that's even legal. Yeah. And the Post, and you know, if that's one of those things that if a private company did it, people would be all over it. Oh, see how evil those capitalists are. They won't let them take lunch breaks. Mm -hmm. But the Post talked to this one disgruntled cop from the 105th Precinct. Quote, everyone here is under orders. No time off during the summons catch up blitz. And the majority of new summonses written aren't protecting the public in any way. Now they're realizing how much revenue the city is losing and they're enforcing their will upon us. And this included things like one lieutenant ordering police cars to create DUI checkpoints. No one was allowed to return to the precinct or take a meal break unless they each had two summonses written. If Tim was here, I'm sure he'd say the same thing. If this doesn't make you realize that all cops are, they're just revenue generators and the new tax farmers for the 21st century. That's all they really are. Yeah. And even the good ones. And so this disgruntled officer closed off by saying, quote, To have all the manpower utilized for the sole purpose of writing summonses is a very dangerous way to utilize manpower. This is now what we're out here for. And the thing is, if the higher-ups at the NYPD really cared about law and order, they'd make their police stop arresting people who cause no harm to others, as police in Dallas, Texas have largely done, by engaging not in authoritarian despotism, but in community-based policing. And this is a report showing that Dallas's 2014 murder rate was its lowest since 1930, the year Bonnie and Clyde first met. They have a preliminary count of 116 murders last year. They have one unexplained death, so that might, may tick up to 117. But that's still the lowest yearly murder rate since 1965, and it's a big drop from the 143 murders in 2013 and fewer than half of the ones in 2004. And the Dallas ISD police chief, Craig Miller, said, quote, I'm really amazed at how low that number has gotten. And just the overall crime rate just continues to fall. And really, especially when you think about how crappy the economy's been for lately, for the murder rate to be that low, it is quite an accomplishment. And it really does show that old canard about Oh, you have to do a trade-off between freedom and security? No, not true. Community-friendly policing, which is open and transparent and is dedicated to minimizing force and violence, you have the same crime drops that we're seeing everywhere else. There is no evidence that all of these extra things, you know, police going around beating up homeless guys and things like that, does anything whatsoever to get the crime rate down. And another example they mentioned is Nashville, Tennessee. They've been doing community-oriented policing for a while now. And again, there's been a correlating drop in crime at a historic level, which, again, you can't really 
put causation to that, but if nothing else, it takes the wind out of the arguments about how we need police crackdowns, we need the surveillance state, we need all this stuff to make us safe. We don't. No, it's just because you want an excuse to throw some people out that you don't like. And the article also mentions Salt Lake City uh, and San Jose, even going back to the 80s and the 70s, uh, Joseph McNamara in San Jose, Jerry Wilson in Washington, D.C. Every time someone's done a community-oriented police policy, they see the crime rate drop. And in the case of these older examples, they dropped at a time when it was rising in most of the rest of the country. So basically you're telling me that if we actually have cops that are supposed to do their duty and help protect and serve civilians and not essentially acting as moral moral authority, they actually do their jobs. Oh yeah, and it works. Hallelujah. And so, by making their police crack down on things that don't need to be cracked down on, they aren't improving things at all, and are probably making things worse. All of this makes these corrupt, money-hungry NYPD bosses this week's Idiot Extraordinary! Well, that wraps up this The Story You're About to See is True. No names were changed because no one was innocent. Edition of the Bogosity Podcast. As always, you can come to forum.bogosity.tv to read the show notes and join the discussion. This podcast depends on you to keep going, so please donate using the links on the website, and feel free to join in by sending a question, statement, news article, or rant to podcast at bogosity.tv. You can even stick it in an audio file if you want. Thank you for listening, and thanks again to Jonathan Loche for joining me. Thanks to be here again. Until next time, here's a quote from Bruce Schneier. Beware the four horsemen of the information apocalypse. Terrorists, drug dealers, kidnappers, and child pornographers. Seems like you can scare any public into allowing the government to do anything with those four. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial No Derivative 3.0 Imported License. Do you want answers to creationist claims against evolution? Would you like to know more about evolution yourself, or even engage creationists more directly, with actual peer-reviewed sources to back you up? My book, How Evolution is Scientific, is designed to show the basics of evolutionary theory and how it is so well supported using the scientific method. It's impeccably sourced, with references to the actual scientific material, and is arranged using the creationists' own criteria of what is scientific. Using their own arguments against them, see how evolution is scientific, but creationism is not. Based on observations, accurate predictions, logic, and evidence. Get answers to common creationist claims, and even a primer on abiogenesis, the start of all life. It's all in my book, How Evolution is Scientific, available at Amazon, and on Kindle, EPUB, and PDF as well. Get How Evolution is Scientific and never be taken in by creationists again. People that were caused as predators with no evidence. I wish Jameis Winston the best in the NFL and I'm sorry a gold digger chased him away from Florida State.